Well, I'm not going to use that. I'll try and pull it up for the laptop. I do have a little bit of video in the case. So, um, are, are we ready? Are we yeah. ready? You're good. All right. Um, You could always give it without sides. Yeah, well. Sorry, sorry. There we go. Okay, cool. Good night. Yeah, two you've lost weight. It was good. So, my name's Alex. Thanks for coming. Um, and um, I wanted to give a talk. This is not a, a normal talk that I would give about uh, really risk management or data, or data breaches, or all that stuff. Um, this was actually spawned by a, um, a couple of discussions online in person, past B-sides presentations and so forth, um, about burnout. Um, and, and it really was kind of my thoughts on the subject. And I want to get some things like straight away set off um, between us. It's real, right? Um, I think that it's a, a, a big deal. It, it sucks. I've seen a lot of really, really great talents just get burned out <coughs> and not contribute anymore. Um, and I, that makes me kind of sad, really, to watch friends just not want to be doing what they want to do, to watch them sometimes become self-destructive, so forth. Um, but most importantly, what I wanted to talk about, this is not a panacea, right? This isn't like, I'm a psychiatrist, a professional. This is just kind of some things that I've self-identified that help me kind of keep going. And I figured, uh, if I can help somebody, or if I can give a different perspective, or maybe identify a, a root cause that somebody with burnout might be feeling, that might be cool, right? And maybe we could have a discussion. I'm not trivializing um, this. There's also a kind of a tone when you get into these sorts of burnout discussions. There can be a tone uh, from the counter burnout side that says, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Um, and I don't want that to seem like that's coming across either. Um, so it's not a panacea. I'm not trying to trivialize a serious problem. All I'm trying to do is tell you what's kind of working for me so far. Um, I've been doing information security since 94-ish. Uh, there was a point in time when, believe it or not, people had just Cisco routers with static packet filters. And my first job straight out of college, yay, was to explain to people that a, an actual firewall might be a good idea and you should spend $50,000 on a freaking <laughs> firewall at the time. Um, but I'm not, I'm not an expert on burnout. Yep. Hi, I'm sorry, I need to interrupt this talk. Um, apparently this year we had a really, really specific speaker request for Mr. Hutton. We need, we asked him if he needed possibly like a special adapter for his laptop. No, Mr. Hutton had a request for llamas. <laughs> Something that shall remain redacted. <laughs> a briefcase full of cash. <laughs> Joking. A briefcase full of cash. <laughs> Two blenders. Oh we got one. Well, basin and three. There we go. Blender. Excellent. Excellent. The other one's on the way. Ten pounds of pomegranate, which are actually on the way. <laughs> Access to a lawyer. This is, uh, thank you. EFF. <laughs> and a convertible of some American make. <laughs> Let it never be said that B-Sides Las Vegas doesn't fulfill its speaker request. <laughs> if you would like your own button cash, get him up after the talk. 
Yeah, he's going to sign a bunch of that, and we're going to raffle some of it off later, so. Thanks. <laughs> That's disturbing as hell. <laughs> Redacted was peyote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> figured I was going to do my own fear and loathing. Look at the two llamas. That's pretty badass. <laughs> uh, so I'm not doing this because I think I'm an expert. I'm not. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm just some schmuck that's been working in security forever. Um, I'm really doing this because uh, you know I look around this room and I see the faces of friends. I see the face, faces of people I care about. I see the faces of people I don't know that, frankly, you're disturbingly young. <laughs> and you might get to my age sometime and, and still be in this industry. Um, and I think that we're an awesome emerging discipline. Um, and I think it's, that means that we are the basis for something much bigger than all of us going forward, kind of for Western and Eastern civilization, right? I mean, the internet's not going anywhere until everything breaks down, basically. Yeah, I'm one of those 90s idealists on the internet. We were, we were going to change the world. OK, so I, I went to Mayo Clinic, and I, and I, I, I saw the, the, the causes, as Mayo Clinic identifies them, of burnout. And, and I thought we'd talk about some of those in the context of security for a little bit. Uh, first, to begin with, uh, lack of control. Man, um, I deal with this on a very regular basis. I have no control. I work for a bank, for those of you who don't know. Uh, I have no control versus what the government wants our security program to be like. I have no control versus what the auditors think my security program should be like, both internal and external. I have no control over a lot of those things that I have to be able to answer for. And frankly, much of the time, it's a complete waste of my life, and it doesn't help catch bad guys. Um, unclear job expectations uh, is another source, and I think that's something that, that we have several contributing factors that will create unclear job expectations for us, not the least of which is, isn't the CISO's job kind of a sucker bet, right? Because if, if we're frank with each other, just about anybody can be owned at any time, right? If the expectation that is unclear or unsaid is that when that happens, you're gone no matter what, no matter what other diligence you can provide us, that'll get you burned out pretty quick. And Frankly, I know a lot of my CISO peers who, who suffered through that. Uh, dysfunctional workplace dynamics, all just workplaces are dysfunctional. Um, <laughs> but this does come down to us because we have to, enter, as security professionals and risk professionals and so forth, we have to interact with the business, right? And we have to, more times than not, we're just either a speed bump or a stop sign to them making more money in their mind or doing what they really want to do. I have both vendor management and risk management functions. Uh, and it's really difficult to tell the business sometimes, hey, look, this vendor has to be at least, th at least this tall to get on the ride here, and they suck, right? Uh, we, we, had one, we had one organization where we said, okay, so tell us about your security program, because you want to do this mint-like banking thing with our software. And they said, well, we coded to Quicken specs and PHP, so we're secure. Um, you know, that's, that can create these sorts of dysfunctional workplace dynamics with the rest of the business can create some big problems. Um, part of that is also mismatch in values. The business wants to make money. We want to stop them from losing money. That's not always apparent. Uh, poor job fit. A uh, friend of mine and I, here's a dirty little secret about chief security officers. Many times your chief security officer that you will encounter in the wild, <coughs> mine's different. But many times, the chief security officer in the wild doesn't know what he's doing. We, there were, when, in 94, there was no freaking handbook for this, right? The security officer that was made security officer in 2001, 2002, 2005, they were basically the guys that didn't shit themselves in meetings, right? <laughs> they were the firewall admin that we could withstand in the large meeting. Um, that doesn't mean you're a good job fit to be a leader of a larger team as this entire industry has expanded over the last one. Extremes of activity, um, mainly that's something that's really boring or way too exciting all the time. Uh, anybody work from, go from, from fire alarm to fire alarm to fire alarm in their job and then have this long period of just 
you know, VPN access requests. Um, <laughs> that, that can be a huge piece of burnout. Lack of social support, this is one of the reasons why um, I'm a big believer in B-sides. I'm even a big believer in ISSA and ISACA to some extent, recognizing in my mind where they do fail. Um, because I think we do need the social support, not just online, but you know, face-to-face, human-to-human contact like we have now. Um, and a work-life imbalance. Um, too many people working 60 hours a week. So th these are some of the ways that Mayo you know, Clinic has identified it. Um, I'd like to add a couple of things that we've talked about as themes uh, that were my observations. First, security's not easy. You know, we're changing, but we're in a point where we're in an always defensive mode. Anybody here watch basketball, football, some sports of some kind? How many teams win in a purely defensive mode? None, right? You have to have offense. But yet that's what we're doing. For the most part, we won't talk about offensive security. Um, security is a cost center. Anybody here run an, a, a business at some point? <coughs> a few of us, right? Um, those who do that know what this means. Um, for those who don't, how many of you guys uh, use a free and open source Office type tool to do your work instead of Microsoft Office or something more expensive? A handful of folks, mainly the CEOs, right, that I just saw. Um, for, those, for those who are using something open, you're doing that because you don't want to spend the extra money that would feed your kids or yourself instead of giving it to Microsoft, right, or, or whomever. Um, Security is the same way. My CEO doesn't want to lose money, but he sure as heck doesn't want to spend money on security. That he doesn't have to. We're a cost center, and we're always going to be seen as a cost center, um, and that's always going to be a difficult business value proposition at a board room level. Uh, doesn't have to be that way. If you track the metrics of how many companies, um, customers, you bring in who care about the security posture of your organization, Start tracking that over time, both in terms of total bookings and in terms of proportion to those customers who can. You can start demonstrating how security brings in business. I think for a B2B plays, I think that's absolutely probably something that you could pull off. Yes. For a B2C play, it gets a little more difficult, the numbers get a little squishier. In the meantime, um, if you're asking for $20 million of security versus marketing is asking for $20 million, it's going to get more revenues. They tend to believe their made up numbers versus our made up numbers sometimes. <laughs> um, but the point is this, is that revenue generating propositions is where, is where businesses like to, to spend that money. It does because you can do some sort of machinations as, as somebody involved in risk management. I try to do that all the time, facilitate decisions, but at the end of the day, we're still a cost center. At the end of the day, that's where, the gen, well, that's where we hit the general ledger. And until accounting rules are changed, it becomes very difficult to get the political buy-in in a large organization, say, a lot. Now, if you are B2B, if you do have government in interfaces now, if there is a specific cultural pressure that we might have to acknowledge is temporary, you, you may be able to get more buy-in than you, know, you currently get. But that's not going to change the fact that, that as far as general ledgers are concerned, we are expensive. It seems like people seem to feel like if your security is not meet the uh, spreadsheet that you have lost the business instead of winning the business that you pass. So you have more potential to be seen as negative still than, than positive because the salesperson still won the business. That's you right. just passed the, the, the minimum bar. That's right. And I like I like I love both of these comments. Don't get me wrong. And I would love to work on, on making it easier for our entire industry to overcome this. And I think that would actually be worthwhile. And, and possibly, considering that ISOC is mainly a bunch of accountants one of these anyway, um, it would be useful <laughs> to interface there and, and try and figure out how to make that happen. In the meantime, in our lifetimes, you've got gray hair like me. You know, that, that might be a long cultural uh, change to, to start to make. Um, and a part of that is because our benefits aren't directly observable. Anybody ever try to put up a... Uh, <laughs> you ever try to put up a... Um, hey, we stopped this much spam for just raw firewall metrics in front of a large CEO or somebody. Now, how'd that go for you, Dave? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Please do. 
Yeah. <laughs> we stopped 50 million attacks last month. Hooray. Um, but the benefits of security are not necessarily directly observable, unless until you have an, uh, uh, an incident. <laughs> then they're very observable, uh, unfortunately. Um, so, so these things are just some observations that I've had that actually also are, are kind of outside factors, industry and cultural factors that can contribute. Personal, um, I've identified some, some things where I've had to change my mindset. Um, a Western expectation of self-fulfillment. Um, we'll get a little more into that in a little bit. But that has to do with what makes me feel like I've had a good day of work. Um, is that because somebody like Josh Corman thinks I'm smart, right? <laughs> you are smart. Thanks, sweetheart. Um, the poor expectations we have from our audiences. So for years and years, I was, um, one of the guys who, for a penetration testing company, would start to talk to, I was the guy who didn't poop himself in meetings, um, and I would present our deliverables, right? And for a long time, it, I fought the, you're not secure, don't you get it, battle, right? I had these expectations of our audiences that they would share my risk tolerance, that they would actually get security and the value, that they would really appreciate my work. Um, that might be a poor expectation. We'll talk about that hopefully a little more. A lack of experience, um, where I have been inexperienced, can, it can be frustrating for me to take on something new. Uh, I think some people uh, that I've observed in various security teams have felt that way as well. I had a friend who dropped out of a pen testing company because he didn't feel like he was getting mentored and getting had the experience to do to you know basically break into credit unions and banks. Um, ironically enough, uh, two weeks ago I was thinking about him when I wrote this slide. Two weeks ago, he contacted me on LinkedIn to, to see if I would do his, uh, you know, CISSP recommendation, um, where I had to explain I don't do that. Um, so lack of experience can be one. Lack of self-confidence. Um, so I have, I think those of us who have been, who lived through the '90s, we, you can kind of identify what this means, right? We didn't have a blueprint. We didn't know what we were doing. We still don't know what we were doing. Uh, but at the end of the day, some of those people who have been successful, it's not because they're really smarter than anybody in this room. I'm certainly not. It's not because that, um, uh, that they were even monumentally more lucky or had better information to use than anybody else in this room. A lot of times it's just because they got over the lack of self-confidence and did shit, to be frank with you. Um, stubbornness. Um, where I get stubborn, and so I have a, that, that lack of self-confidence is something that I just, I have to do the whole hike up my skirt and get going. Stubbornness, um, I can be a stubborn asshole, um, but all that to say, I can want to do things my way without listening to others, and that is a hammer against no nail many times for me. Um, and I constantly need to be the expert in voice rather than alpha. That's fairly self-explanatory. But as we kind of go through these, these are, these are some of my personal causes. I don't know if they resonate with you. I, I came back to that Western fulfillment thing because I recently got introduced to the idea of a craftsman, um, and, and namely the Japanese perspective on that through um, this gentleman. Um, so uh, there is a, a film, his name is Jiro Ono, and he is actually, it's amazing, and I'll show you the trailer in just a second. Um, he's this 85-year-old gentleman who has a sushi stand uh, inside of uh, a subway station in Japan. Anybody seen this film, by the way? A couple of people? All right. I loved this film. Um, it's 10 seats at a bar. Uh, I think they were talking at, at, at the time. It's prices started at 300 bucks, I believe. Right. Eight month waiting list, three Michelin stars, the only Michelin starred um, uh, sushi joint, if you will, and, and a perfectionist. And what I really got out of this was um, really this whole fall in love with your work angle. Right. So as I looked at burned out, Burnout and I thought about it and I had this movie influence me a little bit, I thought, okay, maybe, just maybe, this idea of a craftsmanship is where I've been successful at avoiding burnout. Um, maybe that's something where I had embodied this unwittingly in the past. So 
Let me show you this. So what, what I took away from this is really it is about craftsmanship. It's not about being a smart guy. It's not about being the voice in the boardroom that's listened to or any of that. It's um, about creating an excellence in the eyes of the people that I serve. And I have to realize that sometimes I, I act the other way. I think we, as an industry, have a tendency to act the other way. <laughs> The irony of this slide is I ate there last night and the salad did a number on me. The salad or a lot of liquor, probably both. Um, also, if you go to the Gordon Ramsay thing, the, the pub, just remember 2121. You'll, you'll see what I mean sometime there. Okay, so um, I, you, you counterbalance Mr. Screams a lot with the genteel old man that you saw recently. Right? And Gordon doesn't have three Michelin. Instead, he, you know, we have those fish and chips and twenty dollars of shepherd's pie that are that big, and, and I think there's a real difference in the life and in the mindset. Um, and so for me, I'm starting to try to adopt this. It's not easy, um, and I'm making him my new life coach, not Ron Swanson. <laughs> um, and thinking about this, in the times where I've been most productive in my life, um, it was definitely a, a there was no conscientious choice to wake up and try and blog or write or create a, a, a deliverable uh, that somebody was going to consume. Um, that's not always the case. I have to drag my ass uh, in front of a computer screen sometimes um, to do stuff that I don't want to do, namely HR work. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's definitely one of those things where you realize you're in that group. Um, and it, and it helps contribute to this obsessiveness. The, the whole Jiro dreams of sushi is because the man actually dreams of sushi. He has grand visions of it. He self-identifies with his craft. Um, but that obsessiveness is not about him. It's not about marketing him. Um, it's very much uh, an obsessiveness about the deliverable. It is essential to check every de detail, is the quote there. And if 
we don't recognize what the details are that we have to check. And I'm not so much talking about um, having some unpatched vulnerability. It is the ability to check every detail and our ability to explain that to folks um, and to get them to make better decisions. Um, that's where this every detail comes in. It, it's about the craft. The product is the result of that craftsmanship for me. Um, that's something that I'm trying to take into to my work now. You must dedicate your life to mastering your skill. Um, this means to me I'm going back to school learn things that I've had to be either an autodidact on and to learn them better, uh, or it means for a chance um, going out and finding things outside of security and bringing them in and try to apply them to see if there's any benefit there. When we did the data breach investigations report, the true brilliance there um, was Wade Baker and Peter Tippett, Dr. Peter Tippett had a background and applied an epidemiological approach. Right? He was an actual, he's an actual medical doctor, right? He's like, oh, well, data breaches, we're gonna take a CDC-like approach, and we're gonna figure out what goes on. And he brought something outside in. The risk IO talk that just happened, right? The guy who was standing up there who basically blew away CVSS um, and actually had evidence-based probabilities for trying to find what vulnerabilities are gonna be exploited the most. That was a seminal talk over there just now. Um, he's a data scientist. He knows nothing about security. He has Ed Bellis with him, who used to be a CISO, who's explaining it within, the, within that context. But that company brought somebody completely outside of security. They didn't take a firewall admin and bring him and say, okay, now quick, learn game theory, right? They brought somebody completely outside. Now that doesn't mean we have to continue, always bring people outside. That means we need, in my experience, I need to bring things from outside and start applying them in. Um, it's, it's also not just settling, right? This, the, the quote here is, I don't think I've achieved perfection. Now if you watch the movie, you'll watch the food critic just absolutely just gush over this guy and say, you know, when he dies, it will be centuries before there's anybody who brings this level of perfection to their work. But here he's 85 and he wants to continue to improve. Um, contrast that with our security rock star mentality, right? That's kind of humbling um, right there. On the other hand, it's also about rebelling, right? And this quote is great, I love this. Always doing what you're told doesn't mean you'll succeed in life. For us, and one of the great things about, I, I know I'm, I'm still on that risk I talk from next door. One of the great things about that was everybody was started going, holy crap. This means I have something to discuss with audit. I have something to discuss with my PCI QSA and so on and so forth. And what was cool about that was, well, good luck because now you're a rebel. Now you're using data, using evidence, using the real world against somebody's made up standard, right? But those people who are going to do that and be successful, they're really rebelling against that sort of status quo. Um, sacrifices are gonna have to be made if one of the things that comes through in this is how much of you know, his personal life um, he sacrificed, I can't advocate that as a father of five. Um, I just can't. Um, but I think that's an interesting quote because from, this is somebody from the outside, obviously not Jira, saying he got to be insane to have any regrets. Now, the craftsman is recognized for that. Um, never stopping. Obviously, we've talked about how uh, <laughs> for him the journey's not over, even though he's 85 and considered possibly the greatest sushi um, chef ever. Right? There's a point at which we have to go to love criticism of ourselves and create that feedback loop. Um, I, I want to make this a, a meme somehow. Like, you know, there's too much Java, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But it really is about understanding what the, it really, for me, it really is understanding um, how somebody can look at what I do and give me honest feedback that'll make me better. Um, for those who know Uvix, one of the greatest things that happened to me in the last year is after my RBA sec talk, Uvix came up to me and said, that sucked. Like, okay, cool, do tell. 
Um, and you know, I, I think I've improved that specific talk as I've listened uh, based on that feedback. And I love the fact that he came up, uh, you know, considered me a friend to come up and, and do that for me. Um, there's some things I find about this as well, as I've looked around for craftsmen. And I think not just of Jiro here, now I'm starting to think about you know, craftsmen, Mies van der Rohe, Frank Lloyd Wright, some other people like that, um, who I would consider it as uh, top of their game. Not all of them are egoless, but the craftsmanship itself is not about the person, it's about the work product. It's also generally shouldn't be mean, right? It just shouldn't be <laughs> this guy's screaming. Um, and if you find yourself in, in an organization where that is your CIO, CSO, or whomever, you know, my, I, I encourage you to leave. There's 0% unemployment. You're all wonderful people. You don't have to put up with that shit. Speaking of which, um, it's, this is not, th th there's no guarantees that this is a smooth road, right? Um, everybody, just because you think you're a craftsman or you start adopting these principles doesn't mean that bad things are going to happen um, and that you're going to have to deal with it. The other thing that, that really came to me is this is not something that you're going to attain. Um, there's no power-ups. There's no level up here, right? It's actually more about who you decide to become, uh, as I see it, right? Jiro never set out to say, I'm going to be the best sushi master ever. It wasn't like he was going to go try and save the princess there. He wanted to make great sushi. He decided to make great sushi. He decided to become, to adopt that craftsman spirit. So um, last kind of few minutes, I thought I'd talk about um, how I see cooking like Jiro in my current job, and, and maybe we can apply that broad, more broadly. So first off, um, I, I just identified a handful of things here. So the first one is understand your customer needs. There's this great shot where they have like Tokyo's greatest film, or I'm sorry, food critic, and Jiro puts out the sushi in front of him. The guy just goes, you know, and I was like, how cavalier is this guy, right? If I had this wonderful piece of sushi, I'd be like, mm -hmm. you know, but he just shoves it in. And while he's doing that, right, I'm gonna pick on you, Jiro's like this watching him chew, like watching every little piece of his face for some feedback there, right? And so it's understanding your customer's needs. And so as we think about it, I think the question that, that we might want to ask ourselves, whether we're consultants or whether we work in a, um, a large organization, um, is what is it that our customer needs? Um, I'll open this up. This is, I won't make this a rhetorical slide question. Um, what do your customers need? Who are your customers and what do they need? They need visibility. Visibility? I think part of the challenge is they don't know what they need. Um, and I think that part of our job is to help them define that in a meaningful way, but I don't think that we necessarily know what they need either. Good. They need a solution to their problem. Solution to their problem? I like that. Value for their money. Value for their money? They need to realize that they do have problems. Realize they do have problems? Better understanding of the threat. Better understanding of the threat? Whatever they say to me. <laughs> Whatever they say to me. <laughs> Spoken <laughs> like a true consultant. <laughs> yes. Help making a good choice for the organization. Oh, you win. You win. <laughs> When I boil this down, and I think if you talk to a really good CISO, uh, what our co and everybody who answered this question embodied this into some degree. What our customers really need to do are, are, is make good decisions. That's it. We're decision support. We're not longer an expense structure. If we're going to get to the point where we can tie ourselves to revenue or profit, right? It's because we're contributing to some quality-based decision. Now that's going to include things like um, educating about threats, educating about the probabilities on threats. It's going to include whatever you want, let me listen, all of that stuff. But this is the craftsmanship. It's not necessarily I'm going to create a great exploit or I'm going to create a great defense in depth structure as a security architect, right? It's understanding that and going for that. Decision support in business language. 
business language, right? If you're going to be a true craftsman, right, you're not going to give them decision support in the language that they don't understand, right? Oh my gosh, so there's a sushi place by us um, in, in Utah. Anybody, anybody ever been to Utah? Interesting place, right? So they have something there called fry sauce. Anybody ever had fry sauce? Yeah, for those of you who haven't, fry sauce is this wonderful mix of ketchup and mayonnaise, right? And you mix it all up and you put it on French fries, right? It's kind of like Thousand Island dressing about the, about the pickles. So we went to this cheap sushi place and they're like, hey, do you want some yum yum sauce with your sushi? And we're like, what the heck? You know, and the, and the waitress was really apologetic. She's like, I promise you it's not fry sauce. And we're like, okay. And so they brought it out and sure enough, it was fry sauce with paprika in it. Um, <laughs> right? But it, it really is, what is your work designed to do, right? What is your work designed to do is, is really um, in what your customer needs. Is your work designed to actually give them a better experience? I mean, as much as I'm joking about fry sauce on sushi for the Utah market, some people think that that's great. They know their market. These people want ketchup and mayonnaise on everything, right? <laughs> so what is your des work designed to do? And sometimes it's going to mean we have to have fry sauce, but sometimes it means let's take a look at our deliverable and how we deliver it, right? I'm not saying we have to all, um, you know, we have to all start dressing like an executive. I mean, it doesn't mean we have to say things like paradigm shift, right? It doesn't mean that at all. Um, but what it does mean is understanding what they want, what they need, and how we can get them to make that better decision in a language that they're going to understand. I love that. Understand their experience this is the next one. Now, for somebody who doesn't like fry sauce, right, the experience that I got at that sushi joint was awful. I was like, how, why would you do this to perfectly good fish? Um, that experience was very poor. It's, it's also something that I think we tend to embody at times. If you wonder why you're not getting repeat business, as a consultant, if you wonder why um, that the business isn't necessarily listening to you, if you wonder why you're getting feedback about, uh, geez, I have to go request a firewall rule change um, from the business, it's because that customer's experience is absolute crap. That's why. And this is excellence inside, uh, in the eyes of your audience. and. and Obviously, let's have the obligatory Apple example here when we talk about craftsmanship and the customer experience. So this was um, a Samsung Windows Phone in two, October 2007, I think, right? Uh, of course, in January 2007, that phone was introduced. And so there's a very unique customer experience difference there. And I know it's trite, and I know it's, it's obligatory, to talk about um, an iPhone being different, but I honestly remember my first iPhone and sitting there and going, holy crap, it was a fall day, and I remember be being on a skateboard when I was in 14 um, in a skate park with a giant Walkman listening to um, Ceremony by New Order, right? 1983, whatever. And um, all of a sudden that sound came on my iPhone, I was like, holy shit, I live in the future, right? <laughs> And it's, it's like this, it's not this, and I don't have all this crazy stuff. It's, it's the little slab of glass that I touch, and things happen, and I'm just older and fatter now, um, and I can't ride a skateboard anymore. But it, it definitely is, somebody has crafted an experience for you, and now what do Samsung's phones look like, right? You know, they look like this. They look like a black slab of glass, because that's our experience. Um, in the same way, right? What does the pen test report of five years from now look like? Right? Where's, what, are, what are the risk values? And how are they presented? Are they still stoplights? <coughs> right? How do we use data? How do we come to a conference and find out crazy people doing crazy things with probabilistic statements based on data in order to optimize the patching experience? Um, understand the product you deliver is, is much the same thing. right? that craftsman, that sweating the details. Um, I'll tell you a story from my work. Uh, this is from the operational risk realm. I have IT risk and op risk now. Uh, where they had been wanting to get a policy change through banking ops. 
and they presented data and they talked about this and that and the other thing to these folks. And I looked at the reports they gave and I said, well, let's give it one more shot. This is when I was brand new at the bank. And so I went and I threw away Excel and I went into um, different visualization tools, different reporting tools. I created a succinct scorecard using the same data, the same information, um, took away a lot of the, you know, applied a lot of data viz principles to it, um, read my Stephen Few. We presented again to the operations director of the bank and she used to be head of audit and she said, this is the best risk work I've ever seen. Meanwhile, the guy I was working with is looking at me like, what the hell just happened? Because he had presented the same data 90 days before and had it rejected, right? It was all about that experience. It was all about the product that I delivered there that made a better decision and informed. And it was understanding the data viz and pulling away a lot of the craziness in the large seven page report with all the, all the 3D pie charts and so forth and just saying minimalism. Understand the decision that has to be made and lead them to that water. Um, no colors, too, right? Yes. That's right. I, I actually, yeah. No. The DVR thing, was it? I did gradients. No, I didn't do any <laughs> gradients or anything. Um, understand how the ingredients create the product. That's more on the, on the data this side. Understand how the customer experience is going. Understand how the work that you do in the details around threat intel, in the details around the vulnerabilities we exploit and how easy they are, ex they are to exploit, how those ingredients combine to create that report. It's a, it's so uh, I thought, I'm, I'm getting short on time, sorry, this is the first time I've given this. Um, I thought I'd talk about a couple of experience here. Firewall administration as an experience, right? So, um, new rule set into the firewall, you know, how does that happen at a large organization? Typically, there's a Word document form somewhere that somebody fills out, clicks on something here or there, sends off to some queue, emails to somebody, and you know, three weeks later, suddenly the tickets close and the rule set changes, and everybody's frustrated, right? Um, or it's denied, even worse yet. Like, do you want to use Evernote? No, you know, all that stuff happens. Firewall administration and the customer. It, if we looked at the entire experience, it would be how we would want a firewall change to happen. How we would want some our moms and our dads to know how a firewall change would happen. Because they would not be necessarily exposed to the magic of the back end. Pen test, sales, scoping, execution, delivery. Right? What you do, the main value, it's not there. That's cool for us, that's what we like to do, right? But it's not, it's honestly not there. There's a huge amount of, of benefit in facilitating the scoping process. The best ten, pen testers that I've seen, the best pen testers that I've employed, they scope well with me. They give me good decisions about what my scope really should be. And they help me through that and they spend a lot of time there. Delivery as well, right? Um, it is aesthetically pleasing. It's succinct and to the point. Yes, there's detail if I want to dig through it, uh, but ain't nobody got time for that. Um, security decision support, right? And this is the this is one of those other areas. If if you're feeling burned out because you're constantly saying no, then maybe you're burned out because you're constantly saying no, and we're not considering how to get to yes with the business. Um, decision support is a huge piece of, I think, what it means to be a craftsman in our industry. So understanding the ingredients, obviously. And then here's the, here's the kicker for me, is, thank you, creating the, uh, and using a feedback loop without ego. So I, I, I travel some, and I had a really bad travel experience for recently. I thought, uh, man, I will never use this airline again. Of course, I use them to fly out here too, right? Uh, because what other choice do I have? Um, but I had this awful experience that everybody's had a bad airline experience. And I wanted to give feedback, right? And so what does the airline do? They send me, here's a survey. Fill out the survey. Well, if you've ever had a poor experience and you've been presented with, and here's the survey, how do you feel like 
well, okay, great. I'm gonna fill out a survey and then my information is gonna be one of thousands of poor experiences. They're gonna identify some trends and then they're never gonna fix the real problem that everybody has, which is that the airline sucks because of blah. Right? That's how I feel every time I see a survey about a poor customer experience. How often are we doing that and not having a real conversation with those that we serve? Successful or unsuccessful, right? Um, I think the feedback loop without ego has to be discussion based. It can't be a survey, it can't be um, something where you click through some multiple choice. Um, it really should be based on feelings. Um, it's, yes, the data guy just said that. Um, as much as it, is, as it is data, how we, the feelings and the reactions that we create uh, will help us as long as we do it without ego. Um, that's also very, very difficult. It's exceedingly difficult for me because I'm a son of a bitch. Um, and so when I think about cooking like Jiro, right, when I think about this within the context, these are some of the things that I'm, I'm starting to self-identify for security. So I know this wasn't a, a huge security talk. Sorry if you were expecting something about risk and fair and scatter plots and Monte Carlo simulations. And talked to you about that until I'm blue in the face. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd open it up for some discussion. We have uh, five minutes or so. Please, Josh. I love the Jira movie because I love that you used it. I think it'll make more sense if people watch it. I'm struggling with something. Yeah. I've seen a lot of our friends burn out, give up, do different things, channel their energy. So I, I'm very drawn to the truth in what you're saying that we should focus on doing excellent work and excellence in our work. I also struggle with the fact that you can be an excellent QSA and it's not helping anybody. And I'm not saying it's bad to be a QSA, but you can find excellence in the wrong path. So how do we, I'm also seeing a different group that's saying let's focus on outcomes and be very creative and experimental in that. So how would you balance excellence in one trade? How do you choose which trade to be excellent in? How do you choose to focus and balance that with Okay, so. Did I, did I ask it right? No, I think you asked it right. I think that this is, um, I'll, I'll give you my experience. Um, and I'll use the QSA analogy because goodness knows a lot of our friends that are burned out is because of QSAs. Um, so in 2004, 2005, right, when I, I first, well, I really started embracing risk analysis before that. Um, I was doing Octave. I was doing 800-30, 2002. Um, in 2002, my pen test company uh, CEO figured out that we could charge an extra 50 grand if we made up risk statements, you know, right? That's what, that's what generally happened. And plus the government said, thou shalt do risk uh, to financial institutions. And so they said, Alex, figure it out, right? And so, you know, we created this these standards, bodies based things around what that meant. I hated that. God, I hated that, right? Because I knew that there was absolute bullshit between it. It was totally subjective. So what I did was I went out and I found this guy who actually developed